there's uh, lots of themes going to already I can see things coming up and, and that so uh, I'm really really been looking forward to this afternoon <coughs> having set myself my title to look at the nature of fact and fiction in archaeology first of all I thought I'd better double check the definition so I turned to the Oxford Dictionary which defines fiction as literature in the form of prose especially novels that describes imaginary events and people and it describes fact as a thing that is known or proved to be true now well you know I'm an archaeologist it's my job to report facts about the past and to interpret them for the people of the present but I'm also an avid reader books open up new worlds and new experiences for me and increasingly obviously over the past few years I've found that the two are intertwined so the use of fiction to interpret archaeology has a long and venerable ancestry and uh, this is one of the, the books that sets it out up to the early years of this century. This session takes the positive values of narrative and fiction within archaeology as given. As with anything, however, this usefulness comes with responsibilities and ethics and what I'm going to try and do is to explore the boundary between fiction and fact in archaeological writing. Over the years, I've acted as an archaeological mentor to many aspiring novelists. Margaret was one of them, and some who are already there, and it's now part of the way I make money. Recently, however, I've become interested in the role of accuracy. This has partly been sparked by an author who didn't like the factual information that I supplied and chose instead to use their own conflicting interpretation. Does this matter? Why do we feel that accuracy is important in archaeological fiction? I began to explore the issues. After all, I'm happy to read about imaginary places, people or lifestyles in the present or the future. Why do I have a problem with them in the past? Well, the words accompanying two recent novels sum up my dilemma, and I'm not going to attribute them uh, but if you want to know which novels they are, you can come and speak to me afterwards. <laughs> Both are from the uh, bits that the authors have written at the, big, at the end of their novels. So one novelist said, I've researched and visited museums and sites and taken photographs and talked and listened. But if you're looking in the result for a historical document, you will be disappointed. And the other novelist said, I always tend to look at evidence with an alternative view and my experiments in ancient pottery, cooking and material culture have given me skills and knowledge of the past. I enjoy putting flesh on ancient bones, brains in their skulls, hunger and satisfaction in their bodies, and of course love and lust in their hearts. I feel that many archaeologists tend to depersonalise the lives of the people from the past. Now it's worth that noting that both authors were writing about the same site and their books were published in the same year. In order to consider this, we need first to consider the nature of fact in academic archaeology. We base our own interpretations on facts, usually drawn from excavation. The interpretation's ours, yet all too often the interpretations that we draw become confused with the facts from which we started. I started to think about the nature of this many years ago when Colin Richards summed it up in his publication of the excavation report for Barnhouse and Colin said hence we can argue about the interpretation of a site but we can't question the data because by definition it's something which is given. Now this may be true but if that subjective interpretation makes its way into archaeological understanding as fact then may possibly be in the discussion will usually become is definitely by the conclusion of a volume and I think we all know cases where that's happened. Does this matter? Richards thought not as long as we acknowledged it and I'm inclined to agree with the caveat that we must acknowledge it. Richards went on to structure the Barnhouse report in a different way. He presented the interpretation first and then use subsequent chapters to explore the evidence that might back it up. This is an interesting and perhaps more honest way to present the results of an excavation, but it's not one that's generally been adopted by archaeology as a profession, and it's not one that I've adopted. 
My problem lies not so much in this as in the way in which we tend to forget our powers of critique and confuse interpretation with fact in our construction of wider archaeological narratives. We should be questioning our interpretations all the time. We need to recognise them for what they are. They're good stories. Stories that fit the facts as we knew them at the time. But that time is a brief window. New techniques are constantly being developed and they allow new possibilities and refinements to our stories. Who would have thought that you could unpick the details of diet from isotopic analysis of skeletal material? Who would have thought that you could identify the DNA of passing animals from core segments? We should be re-examining the data, seeking new data and developing new interpretations, or at the very least refining the old. In too many cases, however, we use previous interpretations as the facts on which we build our new imaginings. This is a shaky, flawed foundation. Richards was right. Any excavation report is subjective. But my problems go deeper. When I worked with Margaret Elphinstone to help out with an authentic Mesolithic background for her novel The Gathering Night, I realised there were massive gaps in my understanding. As an archaeologist, I only ever had to write up the evidence that I found. I used this to construct my understanding of human lives in the early Holocene. Margaret came to me because I was supposedly an expert, but there were so many of her questions that I couldn't answer. What did Mesolithic people eat for breakfast? How important was privacy? What did they do with their dead? I found my expertise was limited. It came to me that I really knew very little about the Mesolithic. Yet here I was <coughs> constructing knowledge, knowledge that might go down in textbooks, knowledge about people's lives. I didn't lose the desire to build a picture of the lives of Mesolithic inhabitants of Scotland, but I did start to change the way I thought about it and the building blocks that I might use to construct it. If we accept that archaeological fact is rarely immutable and objective, and if we become less precious about the role of fact, then this opens the way to the introduction of new sources of information. It opens the way to wider interpretations. There are interpretations that are better informed, but it has to come with an acknowledgement of the weakness of archaeological fact and the subjective nature of interpretation, together with acknowledgement that we should constantly be questioning and refining it. Years ago I was asked to update my book on Scotland's first settlers and I refused, saying that were I to write it today I'd write a very different book. And I hold to that. I don't think we should be updating the stories that we tell, I think we should be rewriting them. In that way we can introduce new material, and I don't just mean archaeological material, I'm thinking of new sources. If we accept the transient nature of archaeological fact, we can, for example, introduce the evidence of other people's stories. Here I'm thinking particularly of oral history and traditional tales, and we're going to be hearing more about this. So it seems that fiction, so-called, might play a more significant role in archaeological narrative than we've previously recognised. Now I'm a great fan of Ursula Le Guin's carrier bag theory of fiction, in which she examines the role that stories have in constructing the way we look at ourselves. It's interesting that in the past we gave status to storytellers, those who constructed the stories to inform us about the world around us. In recent centuries this has lessened. We have diminished the didactic power of fiction and increased the distance between fiction and fact. Look at the relative values of academic papers and popular writings in the recent refs, and I'm not bitter. <laughs> it's salutary to realise that they used to be one and the same. So I'm an archaeologist because I'm fascinated about other people's lives. I want to construct that narrative. But one thing I quickly learnt when working with Margaret was that I didn't have a glittering career as a novelist. This leads to me to my second theme, the role of fact in archaeological fiction. First of all, I'd emphasise that not everyone can be, or has to be, an accomplished novelist. We, we're used to the role of specialists in archaeology. Actually, this is one of, of my first slightly naughty slides, so you need to compare this with the next slide. This is popular writing about Scarabray, 
there have been two main seasons of excavation um, about Scarabray. This is academic books on Scarabray. <laughs> um, I think two things this shows me. One is that we might have an image problem. I know that Gordon Child wasn't thinking of, of racy covers and things, but as you can see, he, he clearly thought you'd buy it for other reasons. And I would point out that recent excavations, if you call them 70s recent, still have to be published. So I'll just go back to the popular version, so that's more satisfying. We're used to the role of specialists in archaeology. Why does it sometimes seem so hard to accept that one of those specialisations is communication? Communication breaks down into sub-themes. The writer of the academic report, the radio interviewee, the novelist, all have an important role to play in archaeology, but they don't have to be the same person. It doesn't matter who does it, as long as it gets done, and done as well as we collectively can. So let's accept that fiction and novelists are an important part of the archaeological process. What's the role of fact, and how significant is it for narratives? The important point, surely, is that while the edges of the facts that we give a novelist may be fuzzy, it's necessary to write within acceptable boundaries. The parameters of the context need to be accurate. I think this is why I find it upsetting to read accounts of Neolithic rabbit stews or windows in Iron Age broths. If we accept that the medium of books and other media has a significant role to play in communicating archaeology, then it's important to make sure that the information on which they're based is reasonable. Examples such as the anachronisms above undermine the thoroughness of an author's research and make me question the rest of their text. It is, however, up to the author to choose what they include. Some may choose to ignore our advice. Does it matter? At times, we might flood them with irrelevant detail. I learnt early on that in the interests of realism, they preclude detailed commentaries on the minutiae of flint napping. How many of us would give a blow-by-blow -blow account of putting the cornflakes into the bowl and then onto the table at breakfast time, or of driving a car? For those of us familiar with 21st century routine, they're obvious and unnecessary details. If we want to make our stories of the past believable, we have to avoid superfluous recitals like these and find more subtle ways to get the information across. This is one of the skills of the novelist. Fiction, when rooted within the right parameters, is indeed an integral part of archaeology. It's one that we should value no less than the writing of the grand report. We may not be writing it, but it's as much a part of archaeological collaboration as anything. I love working with authors. They ask questions I can't answer and force me to confront the gaps in my archaeological knowledge and in the archaeological evidence. The journey is one of archaeological fact as much as it is one of archaeological fiction. I've used novels in my teaching and asked students to look at the evidence from the point of view of the novelist. It's an expansion of our archaeological skill, not a limitation. Some have questioned my devotion to the aspiring novelist, but if we don't take the time to work with them, then we certainly have no right to question their final output. The past's not ours to guard. If our academic texts aren't immediately user-friendly, then we have a duty to help out. Nevertheless, fiction is fiction. It's subjective whether it relates to an interpretation of a specific excavation site or to the activities of an imaginary Mesolithic family. I'd like to quote from Le Guin, as she was concerned about the biases inherent in this. And this is from the, the carrier bag theory of uh, fiction. She said, the mammoth hunters spectacularly occupy the cave wall and the mind, but what we actually did to stay alive and fat was gather seeds, roots, sprouts, shoots, leaves, nuts, berries, <coughs> fruits and grains, adding bugs and mollusks and netting or snaring birds, fish, rats, rabbits and other tuskless small fry to up the protein. And yes, <clears throat> all stories are biased, not least because we tell them in order to make an impact. 
Le Guin's paper is charmingly simplistic, but it makes an important point. Perhaps it's not so much the role of fact in popular writing that we need to worry about as the definition of fact in academic texts. If we can get away from ascribing a spurious factual nature to our interpretive site reports, then it becomes clear that we're dealing with a grayscale of communication. Academic narrative is no more factual just because it's academic than popular narrative is fictional just because it's popular. Archaeological fact is indeed the foundation of our interpretation, whether academic or popular, but it's what we do with it that matters. It's just the springboard for what must follow, and without interpretation, it's sterile. Excavation can give us the bowl. It can even give us traces of the cornflakes. But it requires imagination to combine them into breakfast, and even more imagination to communicate to others the significance of that breakfast to the people who ate it. Thanks.